Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'll go a bit uh, about like the history of my company, Cute Circuits, which I founded actually in 2004 and moved to the UK in 2006 with my co-founder, Ryan. And we've been working since the beginning on making clothes more digital. And uh, many people asked over the years, why are you doing that? Are you crazy? And the answer is yes, to both. <laughs> <laughs> But what we're doing is that clothes are what we use to communicate with other people. So what I wear makes you think about like what I'm thinking. Like, am I a person with a happy personality? I'm very outgoing or I'm more shy and reserved? Of course, I'm all bubbly and pink today. And I'm really excited to be here. And uh, the other thing is that we use this sort of nonverbal communication to communicate to others who we are. And so we thought, why don't we add some layer of microelectronics into clothing so that we can connect on an even, even deeper emotional level with the people that surround us, either if they are close by or a very far away. And so one of the things that we've been working on that is sort of like our main um, sort of uh, pillar of our innovations is communicating through touch. So we do lots of different kinds of clothing. Some of them are really visual. But one of the things that we love the most creating is uh, products that can let you communicate through touch and over distance. So and one thing that is really important to think about when we think about touch is that basically our senses are what let us know that we exist. And uh, sometimes people think there are senses that can be tricked. So for example, if you are in virtual reality, you can trick your eyes or you can trick your ears. You can see things that are not really there and you can hear things that are also not really there, just overimposed to your current reality. But when you think about touch, if you touch your nose, you really know that you exist. And this is a test that is very easy to do. Everybody can do it at any time. So if there is some kind of technology that lets you know that you really exist, then this is what we're working on. So making sure that your body exists in multiple dimensions, but that you can actually physically really see, feel it. So one of the first things that we designed was called the hug shirt. That is a garment that lets you hug someone <coughs> over distance. So imagine you're here and someone else you love is far away in Tokyo. So you can give yourself a squeeze and sensors capture what you're touching, how strong, for how long. All this data goes Bluetooth into your phone and is broadcast across the world. And when your friend receives this hug message, they can actually physically feel it. So what we're doing is that we're connecting people on an even deeper emotional level that is different from sending a photo or sending a text. And how we do this is that we actually use fabrics, so there are no wires inside the garments. So one of the things that Herb was talking about earlier was like when we started, it was so early, the iPhone didn't exist, uh, there were no smart fabrics, so along the way we had to invent all of these things and we created a number like of patents and methods for making sure that we could make garments that are soft and feel very lightweight, very comfortable, but then they can do all these amazing uh, digital things and are sort of a hardware and software combination. And uh, this actually was awarded as one of the best inventions of the year. And we sort of all of a sudden exploded <laughs> on the scene. And nobody knew what this wearable technology was back then. And then all of a sudden, we had millions of people trying to buy hug shirts. And we literally had just made the first prototype, and we only had two. Uh, <laughs> So we're like, oops, this is going to be a problem. We better get this industrialized. And uh, so we've been doing this for many years now. And the thing that we do is that we just keep innovating. And, uh, and so I think that this is one of my favorite quotes that you can read above here. And it's Maurice Merleau-Ponty, that is sort of phenomenology of perception. And what I was talking about earlier, that you really exist. But there is actually a science about it. And it's like how your primary cortex actually perceives touch and where you're touching. And I think that is a very interesting uh, thing to realize how the brain works in connection to how your body moves and reacts to touch. And also the other thing that is really important to know is that when we hug someone or when we just shake hands with someone, we are releasing endorphins and oxytocin that are sort of the happiness hormones. So the more you hug someone, the happier you get. And we read studies about some 
made with some of our colleagues at universities and neuroscientists, they say that if you do not touch someone, you get really depressed, which is exactly what happened during the pandemic because we know that everybody started to get touch withdrawal symptoms and because they were missing all their friends. And uh, so the thing that we've been doing, and I'll skip a little bit faster through this, is that we combined some of our products that use haptics, so touch technologies, into something that we can use now with um, care homes and hospitals. So I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. We created the Hug Shirt, then a few years back, uh, we got a request from the Junge Symphonica Orchestra in Germany and said, do you think that we could use a Hug Shirt to let deaf people feel music? I was like, yeah, we can try. So we created this software that can capture and analyze music in real time and transform it into touch sensations. And I'll show you a little video. Music should be for everyone. Introducing this sound shirt, a wearable device that enables the deaf to experience a concert through touch sensations. After six months of development, we put it to the test. This is how it works. Microphones all over the stage cover the different types of instruments. A software converts the sound into data and sends it to the shirt, where 16 vibration motors pulsate with the intensity of the music. For example, the bass on the stomach and the violins along the arms. Several deaf people tested the shirt, and their reactions speak for themselves. The Sound Shirt, now available at the Young Symphonic Orchestra of Hamburg. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And uh, so this one is the, what the new interface looks like. And we actually deployed it also with the London Symphony Orchestra. We did events with children and their family, also with autistic children and the blind and deaf community. So I think it's really fun to see that we were doing this all the way up until the pandemic started. And then we were like, OK, we have a problem. <laughs> there are no more live events. <laughs> Everything has been cancelled. So we were heading towards a marvelous calendar of uh, Mozart celebrations and hundreds of concerts over the summer. And all of a sudden, everything was cancelled. We were locked up in our office. And we're like, OK, what are we going to do with this? And literally, two weeks into the pandemic, we start receiving calls from hospitals all over the world, care homes, and say, OK, we got patients in ICU. They're far away from their families. They're getting really depressed. Do you think you can help us? So we spent the following two months re-engineering all these garments to going from like something stretchy, really like with a huge amount of sensors and actuators, to something really basic that can be put on a person that is on an ICU bed that is all wired up but still wants to connect with their family. So we were able to get like a really great uh, sponsor uh, in Cox Communications in the US. They had people on their network that were separated on the east and west coast. And uh, so with them, we went to create the Hug Project. And I'm going to just skip here. And I'm going to show you this other video, because I think that we did a really amazing work with them. And now, actually, it's been shortlisted just this week for a DNA D award. So I'll show you this video, because I think found out about a year and a half ago, the cancer I have is uncurable. Prostate cancer. The moment I learned about my dad's condition, 
The first thing that came through my head was I need to get out the military. And then pandemic hit. I have to really be very careful, the people that I'm around, so I distance myself. I think that was the hardest with all my children. They couldn't get to me, and I couldn't get to them. Every range of emotion you can feel about a person, I felt that about my dad. Even though I wanted to be there, I wanted to see him, the more responsible thing for me to do was to stay away. definitely believe that technology can bring people closer together. If there was a way for me to squeeze the life out of me into him, I would. Yeah, you close your eyes. Oh. <laughs> what an experience. I got my hook. You did. You got your hug. I got my hug, too. This is the first time I cried, man, since my father died. Well, we got us each other at the end of the day. I made my days be long. But if not, we got this memory. You're right. If not, we got this memory. I think we really like it because we got to work with many different families and now we're moving on a phase two of the project in which we are not just reuniting families that are immunocompromised, but we're also reuniting immigrant families. So I think we're shipping these garments all over the world and just like getting families together. We had a brother in South America that hadn't hugged his brother in 30 years. So this is the next video coming out and I think it's such a great story. They were absolutely lovable. So one of the things that we think is like the future really is now, and uh, we think that you can <laughs> feel, touch everywhere, just this is the best way to stay connected. So one thing that we did is that we combined the sound shirt and the hug shirt into one software that actually runs on mobile, so that if someone is in a care home or in a hospital, they can send a hug to their family, but if they want, they can also get some music and groove on. So I'll show you like a quick preview of what the interface looks like, because this is not public yet. It's still in beta testing with all these people on the network that are testing um, with the care homes. So we are now deploying these on the Liverpool 5G uh, healthcare network. So we're, we're gonna get some really great test results for the care homes and we see our patients that are in their 90s are actually using our product. So I think it's, Next conference is going to be even more fun that we get all this data. So this is a quick preview of how it goes. Say hello to all my friends. It won't Looks be long like. until the end. Yeah. And so basically it's just doing the same thing that it did for the orchestra, but just doing it with your music on your phone. So you can just do your commute and enjoy. And these like virtual reality applications, and these are my favorite because I, I didn't used to be a gamer, but then I actually got to experiment with some gamers, and this was their reaction. I tell you now, it was very intense and the best gaming experience ever, period. Now, when I game, it feels empty. So thanks, guys. <laughs> so yeah, this is what we think the future is going to be. We're going to be like connected with everybody, physically present in multiple dimensions. And, and so we think we're living in the future. We should dress like it. And thank you for being with me today. And have a good rest of the day. First of all, thank you. Uh, that, that was fascinating, it was great. 
Um, I'm, I'm a little scared that you're taking the addictive power of gaming and making it more addictive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the idea actually is that um, if with the system, you could be going around in a city and still feeling the game. So yeah. one of the ideas that we first had with the uh, wearables was that instead of having people staring at their uh, phones and yeah. isolating while they're in a group of people, is that you can just bring yourself out there and meet people while you're still playing. So it's sort of like this uh, mixed reality approach that we always had, so that we don't want people to isolate, we really want people to connect. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I could absolutely see all kinds of uh, uh, weird and amazing potential for that exactly to happen. Having, during the pandemic, experienced uh, a mobile game, uh, you know, one of these massively um, multiplayer online game worlds, and, and seeing how uh, emotionally connected people get, even without the ability yeah. for haptics to connect them, if you will. So let me just ask you about, um, I mean, obviously uh, your, uh, if you will, co-conspirator, who's also, if I, if I may say, is your fiance, if I understand, that's right? Yes, yeah. I'm marrying my co-founder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together 20 years. He finally proposed, like, four months ago. <laughs> well, congratulations. Uh, I guess, so, when you, you say something like this, I mean, you, um, you might, you might, the one approach might be that, uh, so for example, I remember the, the comedian Jerry Seinfeld, mm -hmm. and, and, and without knowing the backstory of his work is that you might just assume he's just a brilliantly funny guy and just comes up with amazing stuff and then just, you know, obviously entertains millions of people. Um, but my understanding and certainly what he talks about is how every joke goes through this multi-month process of, of research and refining and t audience testing and until finally it becomes an official joke in, in, his, in his, his routine. And so I guess I'm wondering for, for you folks, I mean, again, looking at your stuff, uh, behind the scenes, I guess, is, is I, to some extent, what's the process and how does it split between you two? Do you, I mean, do you bring something very specific to the table that your co-founder um, does not, or how do you complement each other? Yeah, I think we, we sort of both come from a design perspective, yeah. and uh, we were normal designers uh, until we became interaction designers. So we met in a research institute for okay. interaction design. And he's originally an anthropologist, so he was really looking at the way people communicate through clothing from a social perspective. Okay. And I was more like on the design side, and then we started working together. But I think one thing to see how we go about designing stuff. <laughs> For example, when we designed the hug shirt, we did a body storming session in which we had uh, a, a few. A body storming session. A body storming. Okay, thank you. In which we had a number of people in a room and we just told them to hug each other and while they were wearing white t shirts. And then Ryan and I went around with red markers to mark the position of their hands on the other person's body sure. to find out which area people touched the most when they hug someone. Right. And so these user testing sessions lasted a few days. People were hugging for a very long time. Some of them got married way before us. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so yeah, there are things that happened. And then wow. we interviewed them and we asked them what they felt. Wow. And so we tried to recreate that feeling. Wow. Yeah. So speed dating has a future. You know, Absolutely. With, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, so, uh, so um, let me ask you another question, which is that um, it it feels like uh, I mean a lot of what you, you guys are doing are you know you're 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 in, you're coming up with new ideas, you're you're being creative, you're innovating, you're doing a lot of background research to as well as I guess primary research to see how this stuff is deployed in real life. I guess how do you now, which is which is all for, for someone like me, it's super attractive the idea that you could spend all your time, but uh, you know usually at some point. Uh, someone has to pay the bills and things like that. So I'm just wondering very, very practically, how do you guys finance it all? Well, we finance it by selling products. So okay. all these events that we've been running, yeah. we actually make them sell these yeah. events. So we organize the whole event and yeah. it's just like, it, it's really fun. And at the same time, we sell products to consumers. Why? So I think there is a double sort of path to market. One is just people that are really early adopters yeah. and some is just like much larger companies like telecommunication companies that want to work with us because they want to harness the power of the network. Okay. And then so is there someone other than yourselves or is this a, that, that, take care, that takes care of that whole commercial side of, you know, selling and fulfilling product and, and, and you know, setting up events and, and commercializing? Yeah, I mean, you, we have a team that works with us. How big is your team, actually? Like we are actually football? super small because, I mean, yeah. we're like less than 10 people. Right, okay. We used to be bigger before the pandemic. Then everybody decided to go home 
So we got people that just went back home and they're working remotely still, which is not really convenient, but fortunately we have factories that do this job, so I don't have to do it myself. In the beginning I used to stitch things myself right. <laughs> all the time. And I remember like back in 2005, we would go to like, do demos yeah. and things, and this is just like, you get there with the garment, and you're like, oh my God, too many people are gonna wear it, it's gonna get destroyed. And now you can literally ship garments all over the world and people can just really play tug of war with them and then wow. nothing happens. So they still function. Oh. So I think that the evolution of technology was just amazing. That we, I mean, it took a few years to do, okay. but now everything is super resilient, which and, I think as it should be, yeah. And, and just as the final question, uh, when, when does a sound shirt become a thing? When does it become? You know, a real something that you're uh, you can get one now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I didn't realize that. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Okay. Get, go get one. <laughs> <laughs> or two. <laughs> Francesca, thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Cheers.